All right, welcome back, everyone. We're going to continue our online lecture extravaganza with Chapter 18, AMS, Altered Mental Status, Stroke, and Headache. And this will be paired with a lecture on seizures and syncope as a separate video. All right, let's jump into it, guys. So altered mental status is just a generic term that means any, um, any change in someone's cognitive or sensory functioning. All right, and it can be an indication of a significant injury or illness. All right, your brain and your body wants to preserve the brain function as much as possible to the sacrifice of other organ systems. And so if your brain starts getting affected, um, your brain controls everything and your cognition um, uh, is how you interpret the world and stimuli. And so if that starts getting uh, altered and, uh, and disrupted, you can have strange behaviors and just different um, levels of consciousness. All right, so th the kind of base level of consciousness is um, modulated by this thing called the reticular activating system. It's just a network of nerve cells throughout the brain and brainstem, and it transmits stimuli all over the place, and damage to it directly can actually cause coma. So you can get hit right up here in the head, and you can still be conscious and just, you know, in a lot of pain, but if you have trauma directly here, even if the rest of the brain is intact, you will be comatose. And coma refers to an unconscious state with no reactions to painful stimuli. So that's why we do our AVPU scale. All right, so AVPU. So if you, your brain, even if you're unconscious, um, you may, your brain may try to uh, elicit responses to painful stimuli. So for example, if you're sleeping and someone kind of uh, shakes you, your brain will interpret that painful or noxious stimulus and wake you up. Or um, you learned about in trauma posturing, like decorticate and decerebrate. Those are kind of reflexive movements to try to protect your body. Um, but coma specifically means an unconscious state with no reaction to painful stimuli. So there are many causes of altered mental status. There's structural causes, which means problems um, in the architecture of the brain, such as a tumor. All right. You can have a, a, a bleed in the skull. So you learned about that for trauma, right? Cushing's. A traumatic injury, like a concussion. Um, also degenerative disease. So um, dementia, kind of those problems with aging. And then abscess or infection. So uh, meningitis that gets into meninges around the brain. Or encephalitis, which is an infection of the brain tissue itself and then abscesses, which is just a collection of infection and a focal point. There's also some toxic causes, and so this would be something in your bloodstream that persists throughout your whole body, but affects the brain in particular. So hypoxia, we've talked about that a lot for respiratory, right? Low oxygen makes your brain kind of go into that anaerobic respiration. It gets really frustrated with you and then cause altered mental status. Abnormal blood sugar, now this is super high yield. Do you remember uh, uh, when we, well, I guess we haven't talked about this yet for diabetes, but maybe I mentioned it during pathophys, but your brain, your body can use kind of three energy sources. It can use sugars, fats, and proteins to make ATP, the energy currency of the cell. The key um, difference is your brain cannot use fats and proteins. So when you have a low blood sugar, your brain will suffer, but the rest of your body can utilize other energy sources, but your brain would um, would be struggling in that situation, and that uh, presents with altered mental status. So this is high yield. Uh, liver and kidney failure because toxins build up in the bloodstream as well, and then poisonings. If you inhale something or ingest something, that could cause uh, stuff in your bloodstream to uh, diffuse into your brain and also cause problems. Other causes, shock, that's a state of hypoperfusion, so that makes sense. If we're not perfusing the brain effectively, it's like a, it's a, it's kind of like hypoxia, right? We're just not getting, we're not delivering nutrients, not getting rid of waste, not uh, doing gas exchange, that can cause ultimate status. Drugs, um, I'll let you to leave that to your imagination, such as cocaine, alcohol, cigarettes, heroin. And also like legal drugs too. I mean, people take antidepressants and benzodiazepines and drugs to sleep and that can alter your mental status. Uh, we'll talk about seizures in our next lecture. 
seizures um, are, is kind of a huge electrical discharge that is disorganized throughout the brain. And when you have a post-ictal state, ictal means after the seizure, so post-ictal state, um, your brain is kind of recovering the electrical capacity of all the neurons, and it can cause ultramental status. Uh, don't forget, we already talked about infection. Stroke is a vascular problem in the brain. So it's all just kind of like shock is global hypoperfusion. A stroke would be like local hypoperfusion. So if I have a clot somewhere in the brain, everything distal to that clot will be getting uh, no, uh, no blood flow. And then don't forget cardiac in origin. If I have a dysrhythmia, a problem with my rhythm, or I go into cardiac arrest, that will certainly lead to ultramental status because of the abnormal perfusion. All right, we'll briefly talk about the assessment to ultramental status. So there's a huge um, there's a huge range of differentials that cause ultramental status. And it is important for you to keep all of them in the back of your mind because some you can intervene, some you can't intervene. All right, so always with everyone, size up the scene, stabilize C-spine if it is a traumatic. So this looks like some guy who's golfing. Maybe he, he done fell out of his uh, golf cart and rolled all the way over here. Who knows what happened to him? Um, he's kind of, his thorax is kind of weird, and he has a scaphoid abdomen, so I'm not really sure what's going on there. They're lifting his legs up. He looks he looks sick. Um, maybe he's altered, but always check ABCs. All right, scan the scene. Determine, remember, this is your first decision point. Although both can occur, you kind of like lean, tr when you size up a scene, is it more trauma? Are you going to a car accident? Are you going to... Um, a sporting event where someone got hurt on the field, or is it medical, right? If you go into someone's home, maybe it's less likely trauma, but both can occur, right? I can have a medical emergency leading to a trauma. I could have low blood sugar and then get into a car accident. If there's more than one patient, consider that toxic gas, right? Scene size up, I would leave. Look for clues. You're a detective when you're in EMS, all right? Look for alcohol bottles. Are you are you at a bar? Are they? Do they have spoons and lighters around them? Are there needles? You know, maybe you go to someone's home and they have COPD, but then they have um, home oxygen tanks. Or maybe there's a big bottle of bleach sitting next to them, all right, that they uh, ingested. Uh, look for prescription and non-prescripted medications. Um, I, we don't do this too frequently, especially if, like, a patient is conscious and can talk to you. You don't want to be kind of looking in their refrigerator. They think you probably steal some of their food or something like that. But if someone's unconscious, it is... It is reasonable to kind of look around. Frequently, what we would do is go into people's bathrooms and find their medicine cabinets and find what they take if they were altered and they couldn't tell us with the help of their family members. Family members understand, but don't just kind of like um, surreptitiously open the refrigerator and look like a ham sandwich or anything like that. You should be doing it for a, for a purpose. So homeboy right here, look, he has home oxygen on. We're taking his blood pressure. Kind of looks like me. I'm taking his heart rate. Everyone gets a history of physical and vital signs. Everyone, right? So let's talk about some sample, uh, additional history for sample. So what differentiates uh, good students from the be best students from the good students is do they, ex do, it, do, do, do they do an extended sample? And by, what I mean is do you ask pertinent questions that are not fully encapsulated by just saying, what are your signs and symptoms? What are your allergies? What are your meds? What are your person, pertinent past medical history? What's your last role intake? What events leading up? An excellent student would say, oh, on my differential is cardiac. And if I just answer these questions, I'm not going to get to the bottom of that chest pain. So I could ask, oh, have you ever had stents before? Do you have problems with cholesterol? Right? Those are questions that extend past sample because just because you say ask what's your past medical history doesn't mean that they're going to know that they have high cholesterol they may not think that that's medical history, but if you ask it specifically, um, they'll they'll they'll, they'll, they'll they maybe answer it. Or when we talked about respiratory, um, when we talked about um, asthma, and you say, "Hey, have you ever been intubated before? Have you ever been hospitalized for your asthma?" That's not something specifically in sample, but it's kind of like an extended sample history, and that's really what makes um, excellent students from uh, good students. So for uh, ultra mental staff specifically. Say, you know, assessing the signs and symptoms. Are they improving or getting worse? What were they doing? These are like OPQRST questions. Um, what did anything? Was there a prodrome? Was anything going on before they got altered? Like, did they have a seizure? Were they having a headache? Some infections can present with headaches, or some uh, strokes can present with headaches. Were they confused prior to being fully altered? 
And when was the last time they were seen normal? This is super high yield for stroke. Physical exam, all right? Um, this is kind of like an e in, uh, head, H-E-E-N-T exam, head, ear, eyes, nose, throat. Look for trauma. Always look at their pupils. It, it takes a little bit of finesse to get good at pupils. I was showing uh, a lot of you how to do pupils for our trauma um, scenarios with real people. So try to always practice looking for pupils so you can see because uh, drug use can modify pupils, head injury, hypoxia, all these sort of things. It's like a gateway into the, into the mental status of a patient is looking at pupils. Do you see circumoral cyanosis? All right, look at their chest. Maybe if they have a huge um, pneumothorax with absent breath sounds or a flail chest and they're not oxygenating well, they could be altered. So just because the the evidence of their mental status is, is not apparent, look over the rest of their body, right? Maybe their abdomen is rigid, they're bleeding into their belly, they're getting shocky, which would present with altered mental status. Also, everyone, PMS, all four extremities, look for edema, that's suggestive of heart failure. And then um, if someone is um, is bedridden, that pedal edema will be in the sacrum. And all, also, don't forget to look at the back for trauma. Vitals, everyone, right? Everyone gets vitals. Rapid, slow heart rate may indicate poor perfusion. <laughs> this isn't super helpful, right? Any alterations in heart rate or blood pressure can indicate um, perfusion. Specifically, lower blood pressure, um, more likely to be shocky. High blood pressure, more likely to be a stroke. Of course, people walk around with high blood pressure, so they don't all walk around stroking out, but um, in the context of altered mental status, low oxygen, certainly hypoxia, and then always check blood sugars on altered mental status. That is like a super, um, I would just include it as a vital sign. It is a. It is so essential to do a blood sugar. Trauma, remember DCAP ATLS. Do you remember what that stands for? Let's see if I remember what it stands for. Deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, burns, tenderness, lacerations, and swelling. Oh, great. Okay. So look for DCAP BTLS, one of the worst acronyms out there. All right. Abnormal respiratory rate. So this is important. Head trauma can have that weird breathing pattern. Remember, Cushing's triad, it's kind of irregular breathing. Look for a weird pattern. Um, changes in your vital signs, pupils being unequal. If you have a if you have a bleed in your head, you can have um, unequal pupils. Battle signs and raccoon eyes. Pale cool clammy, there it is. Ugh, every time you see that, it's just bad news bears, all right? And then posturing. So if um, if altered mental status is from a medical condition, maybe you'll see some skin changes, a stiff neck. This is, this is uh, a pearl for meningitis, all right? Unequal pupils, mid-sized, maybe they did some um, narcotics and they have pinpoint pupils, also an abnormal respiratory pattern. Tongue lacerations, this is high yield for a seizure. People who have a seizure bite their tongue um, frequently, and if you see a tongue lack, it's more likely to be a seizure. Um, strange alterations in your vital signs. Uh, trauma doesn't necessarily cause you to have a loss of control of your bowels and bladder, but a seizure can have you um, lose control. And then certainly, check a blood sugar. So the primary goal in EMS, when you assess someone who's altered, you go to a lot of calls that are people are just altered and confused, and it's hard. But your goal is to figure out, hey, are there immediate things that you can fix? Otherwise, get them to the hospital and they can figure it out there with more um, diagnostic things at their disposal. Things you can fix, hey, if their blood sugar's low, I can give them oral glucose. Hey, if their oxygen is low, I can give them oxygen. If their temperature is weird, I can try to fix that. All right. If they overdose on narcotics, I can give them naloxone. All right. So your your goal is to kind of piece these things together because you can fix this in the immediate sense. Even if someone has a one problem and they're hypoxic, if you identify hypoxia and you fix it with supplemental oxygen, you're at least getting rid of one variable that could be causing the ultra mental status. Even if it doesn't fix them, you're getting rid of these uh, potential variables. So emergency care. So as with everyone, consider C-spine, ABCs. I feel like this, this slide is copy and pasted in every single lecture, right? So just ABCs, if there's crap in their airways, suction it out, give oxygen. Right, give ventilations if they don't have any, uh, if they have poor ventilation. 
take them to a hospital and position them in an appropriate setting. Usually position a comfort semi fowlers, um, but uh, it, it may have to be supine if you have to ventilate them. Uh, these are critical patients. Mental status is in your primary assessment, which means any alterations is a Q five minutes reassessment. So you repeat your primary, repeat vitals, check interventions. All right, now let's go to each, let's, let's talk about specific uh, pathologies uh, that you have to be aware of. Stroke, okay, so stroke leads to focal neurologic deficits, all right, that can be permanent and is a huge cause of morbidity in the country, right? It's one of the uh, a cause of a non-traumatic brain injury. So a neurologic deficit is one that causes people to have alterations in their ability to speak, move, and, and alterations in sensation. And I would also just add uh, neurodeficits of just problems uh, with their mental status. And it, it's a central nervous system problem. So if you cut my arm and you damage my nerve, I won't be able to move, but that's my peripheral nervous system. So if I have a stroke and I can't move my arm, that's a central nervous system neurodeficit, all right? So an acute stroke, this is the third leading cause of death in the United States, and just like for um, for a heart attack, early recognition that kind of chain of survival um, paradigm still applies. This treatment is key to reduce mortality, and I would ask, I would add morbidity because you you may not necessarily die from a stroke. It just depends on the size of the stroke. Just like with a heart attack, you may not die from a heart attack, but um, the residual effects of that heart attack means you could uh, progress into heart failure later on in life. Here, if you don't fix it, you can have permanent neuro deficits and you can't walk, you're paralyzed on one side of your body, you're weak, you can't talk. It's terrible. All right, so uh, early recognition to reduce mortality and morbidity. Um, the There are drugs, so, so we'll talk about this in a second, but strokes are split into two flavors. Um, there's kind of like the clotting fav uh, uh, flavor and then there's the bleed f uh, flavor. So just like in an MI, a heart attack, a clot is in a vessel and everything distal to that um, dies. Same principle applies in a uh, stroke. It's just the vessels in the brain. All right, and um, we can give drugs in the hospital to break up that clot and hopefully uh, reverse or dis uh, stop the ongoing damage of uh, uh, brain tissue death distal to that clot. Now this is this is high yield. Memorize this. All right, the time that you can only administer this medicine is only acceptable within three. And then I'm going to add an amendment, 3 to 4.5, but memorize 3, but it, it, there's a lot of research kind of extending this out ever so slightly, but only within three hours of onset, which, think about this for a second. If I have a clot in my brain, and it's been there for 12 hours, that tissue is long gone. It's not going to fix anything. You give me something to break up clots, a huge risk side effect of that medicine can be very dangerous is you cause me to bleed and I could maybe bleed into my brain now we've crossed the second problem maybe I can bleed out other places so this drug is frequently a huge risk benefit um, decision with the patient and the ER physician and the, the, the point of inflection where the drug becomes more risky than more beneficial is after um, three to 4.5 hours, all right? So when you go to someone in EMS um, who you suspect is having a stroke, it is super important to just burn this into your brain. It is super important for you to determine when did this start happening because that can determine whether they can get this medicine and this medicine can really work uh, can really do really good for that patient, but if it's past that three hours, they cannot get it. It's too risky, and it can also it can lead to death. All right, so um, figure out when this happened. That is so high yield. One time, I went to a trailer park for someone suspected of having a stroke, and they were uh, the person living with them kind of told us that it was it's been six hours since the uh, person was last seen normal, and we say last seen normal as like the the suggestion of when the onset is but then when we were like taking the patient out to the ambulance all the neighbors 
in the park were coming out like trying to look at what was going on and then someone said oh i just saw you like four hours ago and then someone else said oh i saw you two hours ago and so we were like asking everyone when's the last time that this person was seen normal and using like our detective skills to figure out um who was the person to last see them the most recent and then we figured out that someone saw them an hour ago and they looked fine and that meant we could go to the hospital and tell them that this person their onset was um was about an hour ago so trying to figure out collateral history of when that person was last seen normal now a a sad part of this is if someone goes to bed normal and then they wake up at their normal time with a focal nerve deficit uh, symptoms of a stroke um, even though that stroke may have been at four in the morning if they went to bed at eight the technical time is the last thing they were seeing normal is eight o'clock all right, so although in reality their stroke may be started within three hours if they woke up at seven, for example, if the stroke started at four, they woke up at seven, that's three hours. You can't know that because they were sleeping the whole time. So um, if, these, if these things happen in the middle of the night without um, the person waking up or something like that, um, that can cause uh, your you to be way outside that window. So always discover this if you can. And then the AHA has kind of like instead of their chain of survival they have the the seven d's of stroke care early detection early calling 911 getting out there delivering the patient to a hospital walking through the door and then um, making a decision after you gather the data to break up the clot all right let's talk about stroke so it's similar to a heart attack and we call this some people call it a brain attack i'm not really fond of that term but it's the same idea so um here is I said there's two types of stroke. There's ischemic strokes, which means a clot, and then a hemorrhagic stroke, which means a bleed. All right, and over here is our ischemic strokes, and over here are our hemorrhagic strokes, and we'll talk about all of them. So an ischemic stroke can be from a thrombus or an embolism. All right, and uh, we t when we talked about pulmonary embolism, remember a PE has a clot in the leg that breaks off and travels. So when the deep vein thrombosis in the leg, the thrombosis in the leg breaks off, it becomes an embolus. So a clot in situ is called a thrombus. If that thrombus breaks off the wall and travels through the bloodstream, it now becomes an embolus. All right, so I could have a clot in situ in my uh, vessel in my brain, which means that would be a thrombotic stroke which is a subtype of ischemic stroke, or maybe a clot broke off in a distal vessel and then traveled and got stuck, and that would be an embolic stroke, all right? So that is also a type of ischemic stroke. Over here, hemorrhagic stroke. I could have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, and now frequently we don't really call this a stroke per se, um, but it, it is a brain bleed, and so I guess maybe you can consider a stroke. I never thought of it as a stroke, but a bleed in between your arachnoid and pia. Now, we have to take a step back, and you have to remind yourself the layers of the meninges, which are the, the linings of the brain, and I wish I could use a whiteboard or something like that, but the there are three layers. There's the D, it's the, the order is DAP, D-A-P, dura, arachnoid, and pia. And you already learned that when we talked about epidural and subdural hematomas for trauma. Same principle here, all right? A subarachnoid hemorrhage is under the arachnoid, and that blood can travel throughout the entire meninges, all right? And then an intracerebral hemorrhage, a bleed in the parenchyma of the brain instead of in the meninges is called intracerebral hemorrhage. Both of those are hemorrhagic strokes. So let's talk about acute strokes. So ischemic would be from a clot reducing blood flow to parts of the brain. Um, same thing with uh, with heart attacks. That atherosclerosis, that plaque formation, is a common contributing factor. Remember, um, if your your vessels are narrowed because of plaque, a smaller clot is needed to to to, to reduce blood flow distally versus a it's 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 easier for a clot to form because there's less of the blood flow to be blocked if there's a plaque in the lumen of the vessel compared to like a big water a big water pipe if the water pipe is now 50% occluded you only need a 50% size clot to clot it off instead of a much bigger clot so that's kind of a predisposing risk factor and then a hemorrhage 
um, is a blood vessel rupture in the per, uh, in the um, in the parenchyma of the brain, and this is usually from chronic hypertension. However, like chronic hypertension predisposes you to atherosclerosis, and so these kind of travel together. But um, you can imagine high pressure in the vessels can lead to weak, weaker sized vessels that could burst and lead to a bleed. Um, it is often difficult for you to distinguish in the field uh, the two types because you can imagine we can give a clot bluster, a clot buster to ischemic strokes from clots, but we cannot give it to a hemorrhagic. You would actually cause worsening um, bleeding in a hemorrhagic stroke. So it's not your job to distinguish it. Um, they frequently present similarly, um, but uh, in the hospital they'll they'll determine which it, what it is because then they can determine if they can give the clot blusting drugs. Uh, yeah, so history is important because it impacts the treatment. So let's talk about ischemic strokes. So a thrombus and an embolus, clot develops at the site. It is in situ at that site. Embolus means it travels from another area. Hemorrhagic is a rupture of an artery. All right. So acute stroke, because of the perfusion disruption, symptoms vary depending on what brain region is involved. Now, if you ever have taken psychology or neuroscience, you maybe they do it in, uh, in Bio 252 too. You learn kind of like what parts of the brain do what. Like, you know, your primary motor cortex, somatosensory cortex, you know, your homunculus, you know, your cerebellum does balance and things, you know, the back here is your eye, eye vision. And so it's kind of a, a neuroanatomic um, fun exercise to, to see if you can locate where the stroke is occurring um, based on the deficits the patient has. But it's very difficult and takes a lot of practice. All right, to, to, to do that. And you have to have a lot more kind of uh, knowledge about all the neuroanatomy going on. <clears throat> but the, that's why strokes are so variable in presentation because depending on what part of the, reg the brain is affected, the patient will have different symptoms. All right. So most commonly, though, they'll affect regions, or at least these are things that we can assess in patients. And so maybe it's truly not most common, but we can assess these. And that, that's the reason we figure out that this is what's going on. But regions that control speech. So maybe you've learned about Broca's and Wernicke's areas, right? Sensation, maybe I'm parallel. I have a, uh, I have a weird pins and needles sensation on my body or muscle function. I'm weak or paralyzed. The onset of an acute stroke is sudden, right? Just like an acute MI, it was sudden onset. That person who was sitting watching TV had sudden onset chest pain, a clot formed in their um, in their coronary arteries, similar here, sudden onset, acute stroke. Um, strokes can also be accompanied by seizure. So if brain tissue starts dying, it is very seizurogenic, all right? Headache because of the increased intracranial pressure and then troubles breathing or swallowing because that re requires a lot of muscle coordination. And if your brain controls your muscles and it's kind of in duress, then you will have trouble breathing or swallowing. We can, at least. Thrombolytics, we talked about. So um, this, is, this means breaking up clots, or sorry, breaking up clots. Lytic means break up. So if let's say someone has a ischemic stroke, they have an atherosclerotic plaque around the, the arterial walls, those plaques can rupture and cause a blood clot to form there. I also mentioned hypertension wears away that nice vessel lining leading to plaques. So although hypertension can lead to a bleed, it can also predispose to this too. So those two risk factors travel together. Those rough areas lead to plaque formation as well. And then the clot would occlude blood supply. For for these uh, ischemic strokes, you may not see a headache as frequently as a bleed because bleed increases your intracranial pressure more so than a from uh, ischemic stroke. And then uh, this onset of signs and symptoms are more slowly because the the platelet plug formation um, takes time to build up to diminish the blood flow versus. Um, We'll talk about it in a second, but this would be a throm. This should sorry, I just realized what's going on, on this slide. So this should say a thrombotic stroke. This is discussing um, the 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 building the clot in situ in the brain versus in an embolic. The lytic means it is a is the drug you would give for a thrombotic stroke. So that's that's a typo. Forgive me. 
All right, most common is this is the most common stroke. It uh, is a thrombotic stroke. Now, it, so this is incorrect as well. Should be this should be an embolic. Get just get rid of the yt. All right, an embolic stroke is a clot that originates somewhere else in the body and travels, and this is sudden, right? Because the clot's already formed and it gets stuck. Whereas a thrombotic stroke. The clot, let's say the plaque ruptures, the clot starts building up, building up, building up, building up. That's a little bit more of a gradual sign and symptom to, um, progression. Whereas if a clot breaks off and gets lodged, the the vessel is uh, occluded entirely immediately, and so the symptoms are usually more sudden. Right. Once again, it's not your job to differentiate this because they they are very similar, but. Um, the history of of when you do a sample history can maybe lean you towards one way or the other a little bit more. Um, your management wouldn't change, but just for for you to kind of be discussing and communicating with the ER uh, your findings. All right, so frequently these embolic strokes originate from the carotid artery, so that's why some people get ultrasounds of their neck to determine if they have clots in their neck because that predisposes them to these embolic strokes. And this, a clot f most frequently comes from the heart. Now this is super high yield. Okay, I want you to make this association. Um, a disease, a dysrhythmia of the heart, so a bad rhythm of the heart called atrial fibrillation. And this is something that I didn't learn in EMT class and I kept coming, I kept coming it across um, in the field. And I was like, what the hell is this? Uh, what, why is it so important? This, uh, this heart rhythm. Well, atrial fibrillation means that the, so do you remember ventricular fibrillation, right? Your heart stops, it's fibrillating, it's kind of a bag of worms, it's not, it's cardiac arrest, it's not beating blood, there's no cardiac ejection, all right? Now, that same process can occur in the atria. However, the atria only serve as like the entryway for blood to return to the heart. You know, your atria don't really aren't responsible for cardiac output. That's your ventricles. So if your atria are fibrillating on top and your ventricles are working fine, that um, you, you, you're you not in cardiac arrest. You can walk around just fine. You would just have an irregular heart rate. All right. However, um, that fibrillating atria can frequently predispose people to make clots in the atria because it's not good coordinated um contraction of the muscle to get blood out. Blood kind of sits in the atria a little bit. Some of it will go into the ventricle and be ejected for cardiac output, but it is more thrombogenic um, to make that kind of stagnant blood in the heart, in the uh, atria of the heart if you have AFib, atrial fibrillation. And so frequently, patients who have AFib will be on blood thinners. All right, that is super important. You'll maybe hear terms like warfarin or coumadin. Those are uh, medicines that people with AFib have to take because they're so prone to making clots in their heart, in their atria. And if they do make a clot and it escapes the atria, it's going to go into the ventricle and go into the aorta. And, you know, it could go anywhere in the body, but if it goes into the brain, it would be an embolic stroke from the heart. So, these clots that form can be in the artery of the carotid, the carotid artery, or the um, or something like AFib from the heart. All right, and these are usually from these are usually blood. You can actually have clots. Well, probably not technically a clot, but you can have fat particles or air. So you learned about air emboli and uh, fat particles from like a, a bone fracture. You can have fat emboli into the bloodstream. Um, and then these patients tend to have more headaches and seizures compared to a thrombotic stroke, but that's not 100% true. All right, now we're going to talk about the, the, that was ischemic strokes, the thrombotic and embolic. Now we're going to talk about hemorrhagic strokes. So these are ruptures of blood vessels. Frequently, they're from aneurysms, which are weakened, dilated areas in the arterial wall, most commonly from hypertension. Hypertension means high blood pressure and so if you have a weak wall that high blood pressure balloons out that wall similar to a triple a right a abdominal aortic aneurysm we talked about that ballooning out but um in the brain we call these and this is just this is very low yield but it's just fun i like to say it but we call these aneurysms charcot bouchard aneurysms in the brain all right or also berry aneurysms 
So they have different fun names in the, in the brain, but there you go. Low yields, don't know that. Great, and then they can also occur in the brain itself, that would be an intraparenchymal hemorrhage, or out on the outer surface of the brain, a subarachnoid hemorrhage. So Charcot-Bouchard's occur in the brain, berries occur in the subarachnoid. Uh, because this is a bleed, that's very sudden. All right, um, they often may lose consciousness. Heck, uh, very severe headache because of the increased ICP, similar to um, head trauma and Cushing's. Right, stiff neck, meningitis. All right, seizures. Your, uh, it's just your brain is getting irritated from the bleeding around it. Alter mental status. These patients deteriorate pretty rapidly, and then the key here is that high blood pressure. So it's similar to Cushing's physiology, um, that high blood pressure because of the herniated herniation. So differentiation of stroke often difficult. Accurate history is important though. So Although you can't make a diagnosis, you can gather historical elements um, when you interview the patient and family members or people who've witnessed what's going on. And so it's important to ask those questions to help differentiate for the physician to determine what type of uh, patients can get the fibrinolytics. All right, so the fibrinolytics, also called thrombolytics, are the drug that can break up the clot if someone's having an embolic or a thrombotic stroke. All right. So our role in EMS is to provide supportive care and go to the ER and notify them in route to the ER. So frequently the paramedics on the ambulance, or maybe if you are a BLS ambulance, you'll have a phone number to call so you, so you can call even, uh, you can notify them even quicker rather than just doing the radio on the way to the hospital. And this is super high yield. I can't emphasize this enough. You have to figure out when the patient was last seen normal because these drugs can only be used within three hours of the onset. So let's just go through a couple other uh, general signs and symptoms of stroke. Altered mental status, headache, um, arm weakness, bowel bladder um, loss of control for that, paralysis on one or both sides of the body, personality change, pupils, problem speaking or inability, nausea, vomiting, seizures possible. All right, so a you can have um, something that is transient. It's called a transient ischemic attack. So it's similar to angina that kind of goes away with rest, but it doesn't lead to permanent deficits. So uh, this is a TIA occurs and the symptoms resolve within a day of the onset. Now, you can't uh, diagnose this when it's going on. This is a retrospective diagnosis for the physicians in the ER, all right? If they get to a hospital and then the symptoms resolve, um, they can say, oh, maybe it was a TIA, or <clears throat> maybe uh, th this, this is not unheard of, but maybe someone had an emergency uh, or may had some symptoms yesterday, and then they got better, and then today, for some reason, they called EMS because it's more convenient for them to go to the hospital. And they said, oh, yesterday my arm went paralyzed, and then it's it's better now, but I, I still want to go to the hospital. And you, you can say, oh, maybe it was a TIA yesterday. No permanent damage. This is what differentiates it from a stroke. However, these patients are at higher risk to have a stroke subsequently, a full-blown stroke with permanent deficits. So a third of patients with a TIA often uh, get a stroke within a month. And so uh, risk risk factor modification, primary care, all that stuff is super essential if someone has a TIA to help manage and mitigate that risk of them having a, a subsequent worsening catastrophic uh, event. So to compare contrast an acute stroke from a TIA, uh, the, the presentation in the acute setting, because this can be acute, it's just not permanent and then resolves after the fact, but the signs and symptoms may be similar because it's still ischemic. Um, but a TIA may uh, progressively subside and resolve um, briefly. And it's, it is impossible to differentiate in the field unless they got better and they have no symptoms whatsoever. This still should go to the hospital because it could be a stroke still. All right, so all patients need to be seen in the ER regardless of type. <clears throat> so... Um, assessment. Now we're going to talk about assessment of these patients. I'm not really sure what's going. She she's a damsel in distress. All right. So 
scene size up, always look for signs of trauma because uh, you could cause a brain bleed from trauma. Look for CNS alterating substance. Maybe there's some whiskey in here or something like that or cocaine in the drawer. Um, note the patient location and appearance. So she has a strange, she's like kind of looking to one side that doesn't look completely um, normal to me. Um, look at their appearance. Are they pale, cool, clammy, right? Do they have weird skin alterations? Do they have bleeding coming out of their mouth? Maybe they bit their tongue. Um, maybe they lost bowel bladder control. And then look for <laughs> look for buckets of vomit or ice packs, depending on if they have been having uh, nausea, vomiting, or felt feverish. So primary, everyone, um, right? Everyone gets male status and maybe sees, and then position of comfort that lateral recumbent position is okay if you're worried about them vomiting. So secondary, remember, a responsive patient, you do a history, then a physical and vitals. Unresponsive, you do your physical, vitals, and then do sample. So in your like algorithm, what, what to do. All medical responsive patients do a history first, then physical exam. Everyone else pretty much is your, your unresponsive physical, vitals, and sample. So some some things for you to answer to ask, you know, when did this, when did these symptoms begin? Any recent history of trauma to the head? Maybe they're a football player, and uh, a couple hours ago got tackled, and now they're at home and having seizures or something like that. Right? Have they ever had a history of a stroke or TIA? Now patients may not know what a TIA is, but has this ever happened before? And have they ever had any strokes? Did you did, did anyone see any seizure activity? Were they convulsing? Any history of diabetes, right? We check blood sugar levels on anyone who's altered, and so you need to um, see if there's a history of diabetes. What were they doing at, at, at the symptom onset? Were they walking the dog? Were they watching TV? Any other symptoms? Diz dizziness, nausea, vomiting, weakness, stiff neck. Maybe there's a bleed around their head, or maybe they have an infection. Stiff neck. And then um, experiencing slurred speech. So speech requires a lot of muscle coordination. So slurred speech can be a sensitive um, sensitive finding for a stroke. Do they take any anticoagulation drugs? Maybe they have AFib. All right. Um, do they have a history of high blood pressure? Are they doing cocaine, smoking? All right. Methamphetamines. Did it happen all of a sudden? all of a sudden or was it gradual over the past couple of hours have there, has there been any period of that the symptoms gotten a little better or has it just gotten worse and then do they have paralysis affecting only one part of the body or did it has this paralysis moved to affect other regions so if you affect the motor nerves and the brain you can have paralysis but it could also develop and so maybe Maybe they called when their arm was paralyzed, but now when you got there, their arm and their leg is paralyzed. All right. So <clears throat> this is important. Three most common findings of a stroke, a facial droop. So that means the muscles on one face aren't contracting compared to the other face. So if you see one, uh, one side of the face drooping relative to the other, that's a focal neurodeficit. If they have abnormal arm drift, so they hold up their arms with their palms to the ceiling, that's called supination. And um, Kim has her little mnemonic. It's as if you put both of your palms up, you're asking for more soup, please. And it is so high yield for you to do supination rather than pronation. Right. Pronation is palm down with the arm out. Supination is more sensitive to pick up muscle weakness, and so you need to do supination. So hold out their hands, and if they have one of their arms kind of drift into pronation or one of their arm drifts down towards the floor, they can't. They don't have the muscle strength to hold it up. That is suggestive of a stroke. So look for their face, arm drift, and then ask them to say a sentence. And if they have slurred speech, that may cause, uh, that may be a sign of a stroke. If they're walking, observe them for weird movements, unsteadiness. Are they dragging a foot? Are they weak on one side? Do they have poor balance? And then also ask them to follow commands like squeeze my fingers, wiggle your toes, right? You're doing that peripheral uh, PMS kind of a thing. Here's an example of a facial droop. So I've always had a hard time figuring out 
uh, what side's the normal one, but it's this side over here. All right, so he's trying to smile, and he can't smile over here. He has a flattening of his nasolabial fold. His lower eyelid is drooping, and you can see the bottom part of the sclera. Normally, you can't see that. Um, the top of his forehead isn't wrinkled, so it's kind of a whole uh, side of his face is droopy. Arm drift, here's our more soup, please. All right, she's showing um, her hand went down and pronated. All right, so you, they have to do this, and if they develop into this, that's arm drift. And then slurred speech. I'm not really sure if he's um, slurring his speech. He looks um, sick, but whatever. Um, ask them to say a sentence, and if you have kind of um, trouble saying words or the words are slurring or something like that, that's suggestive of a stroke. So they always say you can't teach a dog new tricks because it's, it's hard to there's a lot of like hard vowels and, and syllables in there, but you can have them say anything, but that's a good, that's a good uh, sentence to, to know. So this is called the Cincinnati Pre-Hospital Stroke Screen. And the mnemonic is FAST. F for facial droop, A for arm drift, S for speech, and T for time, as in remember where is, when was the patient last seen normal. So FAST is Cincinnati. Uh, and this shows you what to do and how to interpret it. So I would uh, review this slide briefly. There's also the LA hospital or the pre-hospital stroke screen. People have called this LAPS. So this one is Cincinnati, FAST. LAPS is, has more criteria and is more specific for stroke, but is less sensitive, which means it doesn't pick up as many people but if they are lapse positive, they are more likely to have a stroke compared to Cincinnati. And let me just emphasize this a little further so you can understand that, that concept. This says age greater than 45 years. Now technically in lapse, if you are 44 and are having a stroke, this you would be lapse negative. You have to have yes to all of these, all right? So um, this will miss people under 45 who are having a stroke. Whereas Cincinnati may, uh, pick them up with fast. So um, th that is what I mean by, by sensitive. However, this, um, this screen has like a blood sugar requirement and a frequent mimicker of a stroke is a low blood sugar. So someone may have a blood sugar of 50 screen positive on Cincinnati but when you do laps, look here, it says blood sugar, a normal blood sugar. So a person with a blood sugar of 40 who is having a, a face arm weakness, this would be a no. And that would effectively tell you that this patient's having a blood sugar problem rather than a stroke. So although this, this device is more specific for a stroke, it is less sensitive. Um, the Cincinnati is more sensitive. It will pick up uh, more strokes but it may pick up a lot of false positives too. All right, so you, you do not need to memorize this. Uh, good students would be, uh, would impress us if you are familiar with the criteria here and frequently it's on the ambulance uh, as a reference, but you certainly don't need to memorize it for a test, but do know that it exists and that it is an alternative to Cincinnati and that it, it can perform a little better than Cincinnati. So. That's, that's just important for you to know. So let's just review it briefly. So um, the, all these have to be yes, and then there's d different criteria for the, the facial arm asymmetry and stuff. So age greater than 45, no history of seizures because a seizure post-ictal states can mimic strokes. Um, if someone's having strokes for, or having these symptoms for more than 24 hours, it's likely not a stroke, so this would rule them out. So uh, symptoms less than 24 hours. This is hard because you need to assess um, <clears throat> you need to assess uh, their muscle strength, and this is another reason why this is not as sensitive. Because people who are wheelchair bound can have strokes, but this would say that they're not having a stroke necessarily, and so um, they need to not be a wheelchair bound because you need to assess their legs, and then you always check, even for Cincinnati, check a blood sugar because stroke mimickers with low blood sugar and high blood sugar. All right, so this would, this just reminds you of that. And then you do a physical exam to determine asymmetry. So look at their face, their arms, and then their legs. 
All right. Secondary assessment. Often vital signs will be normal. Hemorrhagic stroke might have a Cushing, a Cushing um, physiology with an elevated blood pressure. All right, respiratory rate may be affected if the chest muscles are affected, and the heart rate can vary. So you don't, you don't frequently get a lot of information from vital signs for this. And then reassess, these are altered mental status, right? So that's Q, five minutes, every five minutes. These are critical patients. Primary assessment, interventions, and vital signs every five minutes. So care, uh, not much we can do in the field because they really need to be in a hospital, but... Uh, as with everyone, maintain a patent airway, suction as needed, ventilate as needed, supplemental oxygen if they're hypoxic, position the patient in a, a comfortable position unless they're vomiting and they need to be on their side. Always check the blood sugar, all right? Because uh, low blood sugar can mimic stroke. And so if you determine someone has diabetes, they're having weird stroke symptoms, you check a blood sugar and it's low, you can give oral glucose. Okay, if someone has a par if someone's having a paralyzed extremity, make sure you protect it frequently. Um, if these pa pa patients can't walk on their own, you may need to use a backboard to um, get them on a stretcher. Make sure that the paralyzed extremity is protected from falling off the backboard or falling off the stretcher or getting stuck in somewhere and you causing further uh, trauma. And then rapid, this is a lights and sirens situation to the nearest hospital. And remember, you want to go to a stroke center so that they can provide... Uh, that those life-saving and limb-saving medicines of thrombolytics. You can't just take these people to band-aid stations. So remember someone's unresponsive on their left lateral recumbent, so they, if they vomit, they vomit on the side um, and not aspirating into their airway. But if, they're, if they are responsive, you can uh, do semi-fowlers or something like that. So here's semi-fowlers. Rapid transport, early notification, I would do emergency traffic, I would call the, we call it the bat phone in the ER because um, it's a serious situation. You can call them and you would radio the nurse and then transport to an appropriate facility such as a stroke center. Now briefly we're going to talk about headache. There's different types of headaches. There's a whole, whole bunch of types of headaches. There's types caused by vasculature problems and that would be a migraine Cluster headaches are usually one-sided, so vascular migraines can alternate, but a cluster headache is usually one-sided right behind the eye. There's tension, which is a muscle kind of headache, a band around the head, and then there's kind of other sort of organic inflammatory headaches. So let's go through those. So vascular, a weird distension of blood vessels can lead to a sensation of a headache. Inflammation in the, in the head these are from these cause migraines and frequently patients with migraines will have photosensitivity so they don't like to look at the light and then they might have phonosensitivity they don't like to hear sounds they may have this is hard but they may have weakness on one side so it can look similar to a stroke some some migraines can look similar to a stroke and they may have weird sensory disturbances on one side and they may have visual or hallucination visual or hearing hallucinations Frequently, we'll call those like migraines with aura or something like that. So they have the aura of weird neurologic um, symptoms. Cluster headaches are also vascular in origin. These patients, these these headaches are also called suicide headaches because they hurt so much. Excruciating headaches. It's frequently retroorbital on one side of the head, in the temporal just behind behind the eye. These patients have some weird neurologic discharges, and so they create a lot of tears, nasal congestion, their pupils may be abnormal, but it's unilateral, all right? So all these symptoms would be a unilateral with the pain located behind the eye. These patients frequently cause, uh, have a lot of nausea too. Tension headaches, this is caused by muscle contraction, a lot of stress around the neck and scalp. You've probably had this from like final exams and stuff. It feels like a tight, band around the head. And then there's kind of other types of headaches from organic or inflammatory. So stroke can cause a headache. You can have headaches from meningitis and an infection. You can have that headache from the subarachnoid hemorrhage causing inflammation of the meninges, uh, infection like an abscess, and then a brain tumor can cause headaches. For headaches, everyone does ABCs. Always do vital signs, including a blood sugar. But 
these are kind of your red flag symptoms for headaches. If you see these, it, it, it requires a little bit more uh, thought and potentially uh, more rapid transport to the, to the hospital. But if someone is altered, if someone has a f true deficit, so they are paralyzed in their arm, that is not normal behavior, um, so they need to go to the hospital. If their behavior is changed, so sometimes brain infections can change people's behaviors. So uh, get collateral history from family members or friends if this is normal for them. Uh, head uh, seizures, if a headache is accompanied by a seizure. If they describe it as the worst headache of their life, right? You learned about epidural and subdural hematomas. Subarachnoid hemorrhages are classically described as the worst headache of their life. Um, if they have worsened pain with bending over, that can be suggestive of um, increased ICP. It's fevers, probably infection, stiff neck. And if there's, if they have a chronic headache, means, uh, so for example, I have migraine headaches. And my typical headaches last all day and are on my right side and I get uh, photophobic and if I move around, it hurts. However, it only occurs you know, every couple of weeks. But if I have something atypical for my chronic headache, that could be a serious sign of something else going on. So emergency care, um, ABCs, ventilate, suction, PRN, position of comfort, and transport. Okay, so let's review some stroke and headache stuff, and this will be the end of our lecture to, uh, for, for this, and then we'll finish off with seizures and syncope. All right, so what body system does a neurodeficit affect? The nervous system, all right, so don't, yeah. All right, the most important thing an EMT can do to respond to a patient with a possible stroke, determine, I'm gonna guess, determine when they're last seen normal. Oh, well, whoops, okay, well, yes, recognizing the signs and symptoms of stroke because that's the first D in the seven Ds is detection. All right. If you don't consider stroke on your differential and you just think, oh, this person's faking and they're actually having a huge vascular insult, uh, that can lead to a lot of morbidity and mortality. So always consider stroke on your differential. So recognizing all those signs and symptoms we talked about. True, false. And then also you should um, figure out when they're less seen normal. True, false. A patient who presents with weakness but not paralysis is probably not experiencing a stroke. This is false, all right? So patients who are having a stroke may not be truly paralyzed just yet. It just depends on what part of the brain is affected, how bad the tissue death is. So frequently people will present with weakness that progresses to paralysis. So this is saying if they only have weakness, it's probably not a stroke. That's not true. All right. So um, if someone is paralyzed, it's more likely they have a stroke, but people can also just be weak. How would you assess a patient for speech problems? Have them say, teach an old dog new tricks. What's the best way to assess facial droop? This is a good one. So you should have them do a big smile, show their teeth. That requires a lot of muscles, right? If you just flatten out your mouth or do a frown, that's not, that doesn't require, it was, it, it takes more muscles to, I guess I think it takes more muscles to frown. I don't know that saying, but give them a big smile. All right. Give them a workout of their facial muscles to see that uh, droop. How would you assess for arm drift? I'll be so upset if you don't say the correct thing of supination, right? Palms up, high yield. Critical time window for stroke patients to obtain clot busting drugs? Three hours, all right? When does it begin? When they were last seen normal. What is one of the first questions you want to know about a person having a stroke? Last seen normal, when, they seen, when do those symptoms start? What other condition can mimic stroke? I've mentioned this a couple of times. Blow blood sugar, okay? So we anyone suspected of having stroke, even if they don't have diabetes, check a blood sugar. All right, super high yield. Burn that into your brain, all right? What diagnostic eval should you do on every patient with stroke? There's two two versions. You should do Cincinnati, oh, well, whoops. D disregard, always do a blood sugar. And then you should also do um, uh, LA and Cincinnati, depending on um, which one you your facility uses. True, false. Bilateral weakness in both lower extremities. This is likely to be a stroke. So this is false. And so usually strokes are unilateral in origin. They're not a hundred percent, 
But um, if someone has both legs weak, it's probably maybe a spinal cord problem versus a something in the brain. All right. However, it's impossible to tell, and so you should still go to a hospital. Cincinnati pre-hospital. What's the mnemonic for this one? Fast. Face, arm, speech, time. Put the time in there. LA pre-hospital differs from it on a couple of things. Uh, so if you pause the video and go back to review LA, review laps, you don't need to memorize it, but um, it doesn't do speech. It does grip strength. Um, you know, that's not super, that's not super high yield, but I would just know there are differences and, and, and review them briefly. True false must exhibit all three signs and symptoms to be considered a true stroke. That is false. A Cincinnati pre-hospital, you just need to have one of the three, all right, to be abnormal. A patient who has weakness and confusion that ha that resolved fully has had a TIA. Are they more likely to suffer a stroke in the future? Yes. What's the medical term for difficulty speaking? I'll say, I didn't even say this, but it's called dysarthria. Well, depends. So Wernicke's and Broca's aphasias, dysphasia is the trouble speaking, but there's also dysarthria is trouble speaking. It just depends on what part of this, the, the speaking process, but dysphasia, so trouble speaking. Oh, here we go. Inability to speak is dysarthria. Ugh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to die. Okay, aphasia, this is not completely correct. Um, but a means not speaking or nothing phasia not speaking so aphasia dysphasia is difficulty aphasia is not no no speaking but there's also dysarthria and dysarthria means they're speaking but they're they have like um difficulty in in doing the musculature so it's, it's kind of different uh, golly okay both hemorrhagic and ischemic strokes are um candidates for fibrinolytic therapy this is important. That's false, right? Hemorrhagics can't get fibrinolytic therapy. How soon? Three hours. How soon after the stroke begins should a person be seen in the ED? Two hours, because it takes a little bit of time to give the drug. Not as high yield. Just no three hours from onset to symptoms. Best position of transport? Mention this briefly, that left lateral accumbent, unless they're fully conscious, you can do semi fowlers but this is just so if they vomit, they vomit on the stretcher or not in their lungs. Um, what's the concern about airway and stroke patients because of uh, paralyzed throat muscles? All right, so they can't protect their airway as, as much, which is why it's suggesting left lateral accumbent. However, um, if someone's talking to you fully, they're not having dysphagia or dysarthria, and their stroke symptom is mainly their leg and arm weakness, you can still do semi fowlers. TIA resolves typically within 15 minutes. A stroke has probably occurred on what side of the brain? Oh, this is good. Okay, so if my right sided, if the right side of my body is weak, what side of the brain is affected? Is it my right or left side? It's my left side. So this is interesting because our brain crosses the nerves from each half of the brain to the other half of the body. So my left brain controls my right side of my body for whatever reason. It's a mystery, but um, that's true. That's just a fact of life. So if I'm having a left-sided stroke, my right side of my body has symptoms. So that's just interesting. A patient presents sudden onset awful headache. Most likely what? hemorrhagic. True, false. Patient 6 a.m. upon waking immediately calls 911. Uh, they're a priority because the stroke occurred and they may be um, able to receive fibrinolytic therapy. So they, just, they wake up. What do you think? I kind of mentioned this before. Let's say they went to bed at 10 and they were normal at 10. False because we don't know. that. Although the clot may have started at 559, they were last seen normal at 10. So that's way outside the three hour window. So that's unfortunate. What causes hemorrhagic stroke? A bleed from hypertension. Etiology of ischemic stroke is a clot. True, false. Hemorrhagic stroke are more likely to present with high blood pressure. That is true. Oh, here's a case. Patient presents 7 a.m. upon waking left-sided weakness. 
facial droop slurred speech. So we have dis, this is dysarthria, the slurring, uh, facial droop, less eye weakness. Here are the vital signs. What kind of stroke are they likely experiencing? Well, I'm not hypertensive. I'm thinking this is an ischemic stroke. 911, sun onset, right arm weakness, dysphagia, confusion, negative on Cincinnati. What is your field impression? Hmm. Why would they be negative on Cincinnati? Uh, face, arm, so this is arm, speech, they're having trouble speeching. Maybe it's hypoglycemia. No, TIA. Oh, okay, I see. Oh, so they called, I didn't understand what this was saying, because I was like, oh, they're saying Cincinnati positive. So they called because of these symptoms. When you get there, they don't have the symptoms anymore, suggest they have a TIA. Oh man, I'm having a stroke just reading all this. All right, unresponsive, 84, collapsed, worst headache she's ever had, super hypertensive, snoring, irregular respirations. I think this is a bleed. All right, I'll catch you all next time.